Welcome to our first session related to Chapter 3 in regards to the audit of internal controls over financial reporting. We're going to be talking about the responsibilities of management as well as the external auditors as we complete this audit of internal controls over financial reporting. This audit is required for publicly traded companies that must comply with Sarbanes-Oxley. But before we begin this lecture related to the specific audit, what we want to do is we want to provide a framework of internal controls that is used in regards to this audit. But before we do this, I would like to spend just a few minutes talking about where we are in the audit process. What you notice is that in Chapter 3, where we are, we're still talking about the risk assessment process. In the risk assessment process, we are attempting to understand the organization, understand the environment in terms of defining the risk of material misstatement. Once we've identified the risk of material misstatement, we can then begin the process of testing where we are in fact measuring monetary misstatement. But the point we want to leave with is the fact that there is a process related to risk assessment that begins and ends before we actually do the testing where we are measuring monetary misstatement. So in our process of risk, we need to talk about this in conjunction with internal controls. Now there is a relationship between internal controls and risk. Risk essentially is the potential of something bad happening. The internal controls are things that we or management put in place to prevent these bad things from happening. A very simple example of this is the lock on our front door. Well, we put the lock on our front door as an internal control. We don't know that something bad will happen, but we understand that there is a risk that something bad will happen. Someone may come into our house and do damage to our property, our home, or even our, our, our person. We don't want that to happen. We don't know that it will happen, but in any event, it is a risk. And we mitigate this risk by putting a lock on our front door. So we think of internal controls in conjunction with the specific risks. So when we talk about the risks of, inter of financial reporting and we think about internal controls, let's talk about internal controls in terms of what they should be doing. You notice here we have internal controls help mitigate the risk of not achieving organizational objectives. The internal controls provide an assurance regarding the reliability of financial information and reduces the occurrence of unforeseen circumstances as well as improve the quality of information. When we talk about internal controls over financial reporting, we talk about this from the perspective of the COSO model. Now I'm going to provide some information related to the COSO model. Essentially it is the uh, Committee of Sponsoring Organizations. There's a very long history related to this organization, but essentially this is an organization of accounting and financial organizations that have developed an internal control process. They've defined it as follows, that the internal control process is affected by an entity's board of directors, management, and other personnel. So you notice that it is a top-down process. The next point, it is designed to provide reasonable assurance regarding the achievement of objectives related to operations, reporting, and compliance. Finally, you notice that effective internal controls need to be effectively designed and implemented as well as operating effectively. In the COSO framework for internal controls, you notice that we have a cube. This essentially provides the framework of how we consider internal controls. On the top, we divide internal controls into operations, reporting, and compliance. On the side, you notice that we have a top-down approach. We're looking at entity, division, operational units, and finally, functions. On the front here, what you notice is that these are the specific five elements of internal controls. 
These five elements include the control environment, the risk assessment, control activities, information and communication, as well as monitoring activities. These five components form the basis of the COSO framework, and it's going to be what, what, we're, we, what we will talk about over the next couple of slides. Our first piece is the control environment. The control environment sets standards, processes, and structures that provide the basis. The control environment sets the standards, processes, and structures that provide the basis for carrying out internal controls across the organization. You notice that it includes the tone at the top regarding the importance of internal controls as well as expected standards of conduct. So we use the term tone at the top to designate the fact that the control environment is a top-down approach. This top-down approach is led by senior management, the board of directors, and others within the organization to guide the control environment within the organization. The next step is the risk assessment process. The risk assessment process is the process for identifying and assessing risks that may affect the organization from achieving its objectives. So what we think about when we talk about the risk assessment is that management must actually identify and take the time in terms of establishing what are the key risks to the organization. The next piece of the internal control framework is control activities. Control activities are actions established by policies and procedures. It helps ensure that management's directives regarding internal controls are carried out. The next piece related to internal controls is information and communication. One of the very interesting things related to the COSO framework is how much reliance there is on information technology related to the control environment. But when we talk about information and communication, we're talking about this from beyond just the IT framework. What we're really talking about is not only information from internal and external sources, again, primarily IT driven, but also communication. Communication within the organization is extremely important to maintain this control environment. Communication is the process of providing and sharing and obtaining the necessary information. Without a strong communication network within the organization, the communication is still going to be there, but it's going to be based upon gossip and uh, innuendos and other types of information that are not very conducive to a control environment. The last piece of the control environment is monitoring. Monitoring, monitoring helps determine whether the controls are present and are continuing to function effectively within the organization. So let's go back to each of these components and talk a little bit more uh, about these. The first piece is the control environment. This is the foundation for all other components of internal controls. A strong control environment protects against risks related to the reliability of financial statements. Examples of the control environment deficiencies may include a low level of control consciousness within the organization. An example of a control deficiency may be an audit committee not having independent members, as well as the absence of an ethics policy within the organization. Now, what you notice, and I want to be very explicit on this because these are the kinds of things you're going to be tested in the CPA exam, as well as some of the questions within the, uh, the course, is we are looking at principles. You notice that these principles are numbers, numbered, and these principles relate to these five elements of the control environment. We're not going to be talking about each of these, but I want, what I want you to focus on is these elements that relate to the control environment and the elements that essentially provide the framework for the internal controls. 
Okay, so you notice, again, the control environment is a top-down process. So the top-down process relates to the integrity and ethical values of the organization. So it's a very strong commitment, or it should represent a very strong commitment from very high within the organization to do the right thing. You notice the second point. The board of directors demonstrates independence from management and exercises oversight of the development and performance of internal controls. Dropping down here on item five, the organization holds individuals accountable for their internal control responsibility in the pursuit of objectives. So accountability is important and understanding what the individual responsibility is very important. Continuing on here, what we look at is, again, we're look, now we're looking at the risk assessment. The risk assessment uh, includes understanding internal sources of risk and also understanding external sources of risk. Internal sources of risk could be changes in management responsibilities, changes in internal or internal information technology, poorly conceived business models. Also, when you think about an organization that's growing very fast, this is a good thing, but also entails risks. So the organization as a whole needs to understand what sources of risk are coming internally from the organization. We also need to understand external risks. Some external risks include an economic recession or a decrease in product or service demand, increased competition, changes in regulations that make the business model unsustainable, as well as changes in the reliability of source goods that reduce profitability. Continuing on with the risk assessment principles. So you notice that we uh, have these numbered and again, it's very important that you understand what these principles are because these are going to be heavily tested in the CPA material. The organization specifies objectives with sufficient clarity to enable the identification and assessment of risks related to objectives. The organization identifies risks to the achievement of its objectives across the entity and analyzes risks as a basis for determining how risks should be managed. Dropping down to the last point is the organization identifies and assess changes that could significantly impact the system of internal controls. Let's now talk about control activities. Some of these control activities are those that ensure management directives regarding controls are accomplished. They are performed within uh, processes, may be preventive or detective, may be manual or automated. So we need to understand the difference between, as an example, a preventive control. A preventive control essentially prevents these bad things from happening. A detective control is a control that will identify these events after they have taken place. We have manual controls, we have automated controls, and from a control perspective, we need to understand how each of these can be incorporated within the organization. Going back to the principles, we are looking now at control activities. The organization selects and develops control activities that contributes to the mitigation of risk to the achievement of objectives to acceptable levels. Now, we want to make sure that we understand this, is we never reduce risk to zero. And in fact, an organization to survive and to sustain itself in a competitive environment must be willing to accept risk. This is a part of business. However, the organization needs to understand what are acceptable risk levels to the organization. The organization selects and develops general control activities over technology to support the achievement of objectives. And then finally, the organization deploys control activities through policies that establish what is expected and in procedures that put policies into action. Let's consider a number of 
processes that controls are going to be important. Now you notice here that we're looking at transactions. It's very important to understand that when we are looking at transactions, we're looking at transactions from the perspective of a control assessment. And in fact, when we are looking at the risk assessment or the measuring the risk of material misstatement, we're looking at transaction processes. The first item here, we talk about business process transactions. Business process transactions could be things such as a sales transaction. So a sales transaction starts at the point of sale and concludes when we have collected cash. Another business process transaction would be a purchasing transaction. So the purchasing transaction goes from the purchase requisition to the purchase order to the receiving documentation and then through the accounts payable and finally cash disbursements. So when we're looking at processing, we're looking at processes and we need to understand what these processes are. So in business process transactions, the control activities includes verifications, reconciliations, authorizations, and approvals. We also want to consider accounting estimates. Keep in mind that within the financial statement, there are many items that are based upon management's estimate. Examples of this might be the allowance for doubtful account. Certain uh, estimates related to depreciation uh, are all estimates that management is responsible for. Control activities should provide reasonable assurance that the data is accurate that these estimates are faithful to the data, that the underlying estimate model reflects current economic conditions and has proven to provide real reliable estimates in the past. Adjusting closing and un other unusual entities or entries, control activities include documented support for all entries, references to underlying supporting data as with a well-developed transaction trail. The transaction trail records, 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 that, records that allow the auditor to trace transactions from the origination through the final disposition or vice versa. We also wanna make sure that these entries are reviewed by the CFO or controller. And generally speaking, we're looking for some sort of sign off. When we're looking at internal controls, we're also looking at input controls these are designed to ensure that authoriz authoriz authorized transactions are correct and complete. Processing controls designed to ensure that correct programs are used for processing. All transactions are processed and transactions are updated in appropriate files. Output controls are designed so that all data is completely processed Output is distributed only to authorized recipients. Segregation of duties, we're going to talk a lot about segregation of duties. This essentially relates to breaking a process down so that one individual or one department does not have complete control of the activity. Segregation of duties protects against, protects against the risk that individuals may collude to conceal a fraud it requires that a minimum of two employees be involved such that one does not have authority to authorize and the ability to process transactions as well as custodial responsibilities. Physical controls over activities protect and safeguard acts, act, act, uh, safeguards assets from accidental or intentional destruction in the information and communication, a couple of things that we need to think about is this is the process for identifying, capturing, and exchanging information in a timely fashion to enable the accomplishment of the organizational objectives. This includes the information, the internal and external sources of, the, of this information, as well as the communication. And these are the things that we've talked about, but we want to frame these from the perspective of principles. So you notice that we are continuing our principles. These are the next three items in order, and these relate to information and communication.
the organization obtains or generates and uses relevant quality information. The organization internally communicates information, including objectives and responsibility for internal controls, and the organization communicates with external parties regarding matters that affect the function of internal controls. In the monitoring process, we need to understand that this is the process that provides feedback on the effectiveness of each of the five components of internal controls. Management selects either of the following or a combination of both, a mix of ongoing evaluations or separate evaluations. This requires that identified deficiencies in internal controls be communicated to the personnel concerned with follow-up action. The last two items that we're going to talk about, and this will conclude our lecture, continues our discussion related to monitoring. The organization selects, develops, and performs ongoing and or separate evaluations. The organization, organization evaluates and communicates internal control deficiencies in a timely manner. Now, when we talk about the internal controls over financial reporting, you will understand how each of these elements are incorporated in this audit. You'll understand also that not only the auditor, but the management has specific um, guidelines and specific responsibilities related to internal controls. But beyond that, we need to understand also that the COSO environment goes well beyond simply uh, making sure that the financial statements are proper. And in fact, in an enterprise risk management process, is management becomes responsibility in turn responsible for identifying and addressing the overall controls that are going to affect the organization as it uh, moves to its uh, various objectives. Okay, so I thank you very much for this, uh, for your time and uh, we will begin our next lecture uh, shortly. Thanks a lot.